Business and hockey, it doesn't get much better than that. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to Greel's Reels. I'm your host, Robert Greeley, and today we have Adam Chapman lined up for you. Chapman finished his hockey career with the Carlton Ravens after an impressive junior career. We tacked on quite a lot of penalty minutes and, you know, had some experience playing pro hockey as well. I do want to give a little bit of a heads up. We talk about some of his injuries where, you know, he had a motorcycle crash in Thailand along with the concussions, and it's definitely a little bit more intense and graphic than... Uh, you know, episodes in the past. So I just want to give you a little heads up. If that's not your thing, you know what? I don't, I, I, I'll forgive you if you skip it on this one. But yeah, just a little heads up for you. But this is a really cool chat. You know, we even look at how he went from after, you know, playing pro hockey to working on his business. So you know what? We're just going to get right into it. This is Greels Reels, and I'm your host, Robert Greeley. Adam, man, it's nice to finally meet you. You're joining an exclusive club of Carlton Raven Greel on the Greels Reels show. I gotta say, yeah, I saw I saw there's quite a quite heavy in the Ottawa U uh, favor there, so I thought it might as well represent us. Yeah, you know, it's every now and then I gotta try and uh, you know toss a Raven in. Uh, you're uh, you've got good company. Nate Bahar has been on. Uh, we've uh, me and Justin Howell have been like working on trying to get an episode together, but uh, you know, just the scheduling hasn't uh, worked out yet. So yeah, it's definitely yeah we're definitely U Ottawa heavy on this side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you've got to strengthen it up, I guess. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know about strengthening it up. Maybe, you know, just play nice with the guys across the canal, you know? Well, I'm, I'm living down here now, so I better better watch what I say. <laughs> All right, man, let, let's just dive right into, you know, you're born in Barrie, growing up. What was your childhood like? When did you really start getting into hockey? Uh, yeah, so I started hockey when I was when I was four years old like right away my mom uh my mom put my brother and I into it and yeah like she was I was raised by a single mother um and she basically like would just like tell us to work hard and then she didn't really know too much about hockey but I guess my brother and I just took a big liking to it and uh kind of always played AAA all the way up and then uh moved to Toronto for like my minor the year before my minor midget year uh like a coach asked us to come down there and then uh we both went to major junior at 16. Yeah. Cause I actually noticed, uh, you know, I was looking into your brother a little bit. I think he uh, committed to Ryerson at one point, but also had a pretty good career. How much do you accredit to him in terms of developing your hockey skill? Well, it was nice. Cause he was a, he was a defenseman. So and I know it's a forward. So it was, uh, it was good to have like the, the mix. Like we definitely would get into it pretty, pretty heavy, like some pretty good, some real some pretty good fights we had to uh it was kind of like a bloodbath sometimes but uh it was good because we push each other right like it's always someone right there like same level as you uh competitive he's a bit bigger than me so um yeah like overall like me and him definitely pushed each other all the way through to 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 develop and to get to that next level now you're, you're the older one right but like not by much you were born in like january or february of the year and he was born later in november yeah i'm born january he's november so like Whenever I, like, let's say I turned 15, he turns 15 the same year kind of idea. So it's always been like that all the way through. Did the uh, nine months, 10 months essentially give you an advantage in those uh, fights? Were you able to hold your own for a while or did he uh, take over pretty quick? Well, the thing, the issue with us fighting was, is like, it was fine when we were younger, but then we were getting to like grade eight, grade nine, grade 10. It's like my mom, like I said, like I was raised by a single mom, so she was at work a lot. And it's like, you get in a fight with someone that's like, like, you're, it doesn't really end. You know what I mean? It could be like a 20 minute fight. And then it's like, if I got that last punch in, it's like, you think it's over the next thing, you know, it's just like, it starts up again. So like it was getting to the point where it was like getting pretty, uh, <laughs> a bit of a bloodbath sometimes. Like, and again, it was like, at the end of the day, we always have each other's back and stuff, but it was getting to the point where we had to like stop fighting because again, like some of them would last, like my mom was gone for six hours. It wasn't like we were making up and stuff like halfway through the day and hanging out all the time. So if you're going to get in and pick a fight, um, you had to be ready to go to war kind of. A, yeah. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a three hour event. You, you throw the first punch and then the next step is you're just breaking out a schedule. Okay. So uh, from one o'clock to one thirty, upper body only then, you know, one thirty, two o'clock, we're going to take a break, low shots, only body shots. That's it. <laughs> yeah, no, man, it was, uh, that's kind of what it was like. It was like, if you fight in the morning, like, you know, like you're going to have to keep alert yet <laughs> more or less seriously. Yeah, so you. They were each other's backs, though. So. 
Mm-hmm. No, a hundred percent. Like siblings, you know, I, I like, I never had a, uh, a brother, but you know, I got a little sister and it's like, uh, you know, you torment her and, uh, you know, you make sure she's, uh, you know, on her, on her toes at all times, maybe, uh, throw a pillow across the room every now and then. And, uh, <laughs> when we were young, but that's the thing I, I definitely, I always got her back and it, it was cool to see actually. Cause like I said, I never had a brother, but for her, you know, being my little sister, she almost essentially had like eight brothers just because me and the guys grew up together so much. And we're always at like my house for a long period of time, which is the house that we would all hang out at. Right. So she, she grew up with like eight, eight of us basically. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure it makes guys a little cautious on uh, not to mess around for sure. So you played minor hockey with uh, like your triple a with the Toronto junior Canadians. eh? Yeah. My last few years. Yeah, that's a like I mean that's a pretty solid organization. Tell me about just you know playing minor hockey there. Obviously, you got a lot of a lot of eyeballs on you because a lot of people are looking at uh, you know with the OHL Cup to scout for junior and then obviously NCAA. Yeah, like so it was a complete culture shock going from Barry hockey where it was like you're like kind of like heads and shoulders above everyone else and like the ice wasn't as intense. Like everything was just like not as full tilt as Toronto. So like going to moving to Toronto right away it was like yeah like this is this is serious like it was uh like yeah it was just kind of taking the next the next step up was a complete like change then compared to like grow, like playing minor hockey in Barry and then just playing in the junior Canadians was like an unbelievable experience like it was uh like we were we had such a strong team like we'd win like basically all of our games like we'd have like some rivalries with like the Nats and like the Marlies and stuff like that but it's always fun when you're on a team that can just like rack it up and just like, yeah, like we were pretty, uh, we we're pretty dominant. Like I think my draft year, like I think it was like 15 guys or something got drafted to the OHL. So it was, it was a lot of fun doing that for sure. Like whenever you're winning, it's fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, you had like Tom Wilson on that team putting up a hundred points. I was looking at the numbers. It's outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. We had like Wilson and then this, like, yeah, like we had, we had, we had a few, a few like really good players like some guys like went to college and other guys like went major junior like uh Paul Asello on there like he was absolutely disgusting and uh and junior Canadians like he ended up going to, he was I don't know what he went to somewhere in the states he ended up finishing in Kingston okay um, but yeah like we had a solid team yeah while he was there so, yeah tell me a little bit about uh what it was like with like playing with Tom Wilson like did you know he was going to be a first round pick Stanley Cup champion someday like uh no like he was he was always like good but but like again like our team was so like dominant like he was like he was he was always good he was he was like obviously he's massive then and he's always had a bit of a he's always had that temper on him like he definitely uh definitely has always had like a temper but like in terms of like uh being like nhl like doing as well as he has which is amazing like no i would say no like nobody really thought that like there was other guys on the team at that time that I'd say we're like more like if you want to bet your money on someone, I don't think everyone would have bet on Tom, but he was always like big and yeah, big. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, like, honestly, you never really know what's going to happen, especially, I mean, being so young too, right? Like typically it comes down to heart and, and who wants it more, right? And I mean, if you're amongst that crowd, you can definitely make a name for yourself and a career pretty quickly, which I mean, obviously he's done. Who would you accredit to being some of the toughest competition in minor hockey that you played against uh, during that time in the Canadians? I don't know if I, I guess some CTE, man. I can't remember everybody. <laughs> like, see, that's the thing, like you just said though, is like, some guys that were really, really dominant, like in minor midget, like this guy named uh, Marchese was was on there. I remember he was like really good on the Marlies. Um, but for instance, like Connor Brown, like he was on the Marlies, but he was like the guy everybody ripped on, right? <laughs> like everyone like made fun of him. Like nobody would ever thought he would have done as well as he's done. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think who else really like, to be honest with you, man, I don't even watch hockey anymore. So I don't even know who's, who is in the NHL and who's not. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like some like the more dominant guys that would like come to my head was like, yeah, like Marchese, but I don't even know what, what he's doing really, to be honest with you, man. Like I haven't followed uh, hockey really too much. No, I mean, if, uh, it makes sense, right? Like once you're, once you're kind of done, you, you get into your own thing and you explore other passions, right? That you, that you have. So 2010, you get drafted into the OHL, eighth round pick. 
Um, 154th overall to the Greyhounds. What was that moment like? Pardon? What was that like? Yeah. Oh man, I was so disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like I had, like I had a really good year. And like at the time, my brother and I, we had the, we obviously had the same agent mm-hmm. and he was trying to make it. So me and him could go to the, to go kind of like go together. Um, so like we were really confident we were going to go to Sudbury. They had, they had two picks in the same round. I think it was fourth round. And then my brother ended up going, I think he went first pick. I think he went third round, my brother. Like, I don't know, man, I don't really remember how it all played out. Um, but like, yeah, like when I, when I was like, oh, sh-, like I was not happy that day. I was so disappointed. So then when I like got drafted eighth round, it's like, okay. Like I gotta, I gotta make the team this year. Like I don't care if I went eighth round. So yeah. I uh, just like made sure to like do good at camp and stuff. When you got into that roster first and that uh, lineup, what were like, what exactly did you do to really separate yourself in that moment? Uh, to like make the team? Yeah. So yeah, so we went to the rookie camp and I like did extremely well there. Like I got a bunch of points and I bought two guys. And then at main camp, um, it's like the t- mostly just games. And then the first game I got a few points and then the second game I got a couple points and then I had a fight and then I broke my, uh, well, it's still messed up now, this finger here. I broke my finger just like going like and going to the boards or whatever. So I only played those two games at main camp, but like just between like rookie camp and I think like doing the right thing, like all summer long and like showing up at main camp and just having a good first two games, they just said, okay, like we'll give you a, give you a shot. So I only did the first little bit there, which was uh, lucky that they did give me that chance after being drafted so late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely not a a guarantee, right? Like, I mean, I know I was looking at, you know, a few people around you in that uh, round eight, a few people went, decided to do like NCAA D3 kind of route. Like you don't actually get to see a lot of eighth round picks really make the roster for themselves. Right. Yeah. Especially at 16. Like, so it was, uh, I was like, yeah, that was a proud moment. But I was mm-hmm. confident in myself though. Like I knew when I got drafted later, I'm like, okay, I got it. Got to prove my point here. Mm-hmm. So now the next season, complete difference. You're going from like, the Greyhounds in the OHL to now you're with the Olympique and the Q. Tell me how that transition happened. Yeah. So uh, like my 16 year old year, like it was, it was awesome. But uh, we had that year, I think there was like eight or nine gra- guys drafted to the NHL and like a bunch of other guys went to camps. We didn't make the playoffs. So it just kind of shows what kind of uh, team dynamic we had there. Like it was, uh, I don't know the proper term to use for the podcast here, but it was, it was fun, but like it was a lot of like a lot of guys were getting in trouble and stuff. Like they fired the coach at Christmas, and then they got rid of the GM uh, at the end of the season, and then that's when they brought in Kyle Dubas. And then in the fall, like went to camp. He had a like he was basically just trying to do like a whole overhaul of the whole team. And then they were like, "Oh, we want you to play junior A uh, for like the Sioux team for a bit, to, like get more ice and stuff." And honestly, I was I was like, "Oh, I have such a big ego. I'm like, oh, I played OHL at 16. Like, I don't want to." I don't want to uh, go to junior A. And then honestly, man, like I said, like, I didn't really know, I've always just played hockey, but I didn't really understand how it all works. And then, uh, so I went back home after the OHL camp when they were like, yeah, you want to play junior A. So then I was just like, went home and then I was home for a few days and then I woke up and I had like a bunch of missed calls and they were all like Quebec numbers. And then uh, I ended up just, yeah, like they're like, oh, like come to Gatineau. Like there's a couple other teams that, that called and then I ended up just going to Gatineau like never even heard of that and uh, I thought okay I'll play there for a year then go back to the OHL but I, I loved the queue and did really well so I just stayed. I'm curious did you ever regret that decision of maybe not going down and playing junior A for like that Sioux team? No I wouldn't say I regret that I just say that I would say I wouldn't regret going the, to the queue at all because like I said I did really well there and in like loved playing in the queue loved the, the environment there uh, the only thing I would say is is that if I could like rewind time or if, like let's say I, like if I have kids that play hockey one day, I would say or anyone that's at that 15 year old age, it is better to play junior A at 16 if you're going to be playing right. Like I would have been on the the Sioux Thunderbirds who won the championship that year, and I would have been like a second like first or second line or playing a lot of minutes versus going from major uh, going from like minor Bantam straight to OHL and we had like we had on paper a really good team so like I was playing in most of the games I wasn't getting scratched I had an injury but I wasn't really playing so I wasn't really developing so I wouldn't say like I regret going to the queue the only thing I'd say 
would do it differently was at 16, I would have played junior A where I would have got a lot more ice versus just saying, Oh, I play in the OHL just to like, I played in all, I didn't really get scratched. It was more just like, I play like under 10 minutes a game. So you're not really getting that much better. Yeah, um, no, for sure. And you know, with that too, you look at the 10 minutes and it's for the most part, 10 minutes of, I'll say unmeaningful ice time in the sense where, you know, you're not really on the ice in those big moments where like you're, you're trying to hold the lead and wind down the last few minutes or even, you know, getting on the power play or penalty kill. No, man. Like you're, you're basically like, a, at, if you're playing under 10 minutes, you're going on there like, Oh, I don't want to mess up so I can play next game too. And then like, I would just like, like fighting guys. So I'm like, Hey, at least it's something entertaining to do. And it's like net positive. Like the coach would like that. So like, I would just like, kind of just yeah I would just go on there and wouldn't really play like how I would play in minor like in minor midget um so yeah you're going on there trying not to mess up and then like again just for fun I would just fight whoever would want to fight kind of idea is that like would you accredit that into how you got into that fighting aspect of the game because I mean you got a couple years there like 138 pims 168 pims like that man that's cr- you don't see that anymore that's insane yeah, that, that's 168. It was the most in the CHL that year. <laughs> really, eh? Yeah. Honestly, man, like, uh, yeah, I guess, like, that was my first, like, first real-time fighting was in, in the Sioux. And, like, I don't know, it was fun. And then when I went to Gatno, I was just, I don't know, I, I like fighting. I think it's fun. Like, I never really, like, like, I guess 16, I'm like, okay, I want to fight to, like, get, out, get on the ice and prove myself and, like, make sure I'm playing next game, like, contribute more than whoever else I'm competing against to be in the lineup. And then 17, I was like, okay, same thing at Gatineau, might as well, like, do a bit of both, even though I was getting points and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, like, I just liked fighting. Like, I like when I was my 18-year-old year, I fought, like, seven games in a row. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I enjoyed it. Like, it's that's one of the things I do miss, though, is, but, like, I do miss fighting sometimes. How did you strategize and, like, mentally prepare yourself for those moments? Before fighting? <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, if you're doing it, like, every night for the most part, like, you look at UFC fighters, like, they'll do a fight and they'll they'll take a few months off. Like, you're you're getting in there. Obviously, you know, you're not going eight rounds or anything like that, but night in, night out, you're you're going up against somebody. Do, like, yeah, what was that whole process? Yeah, well, like, the, that season where I had, like, I don't know, over, like, well over 20 fights there um, when I was fighting a bunch. I don't know, I just, like, I'd look at in the morning, I'd say, okay, we're playing uh, – whatever team we're playing, I would just look at drop your gloves. That site's down, unfortunately, now. So, yeah, just look at drop your gloves and then see you on there who's, who's like, their tough guys and who would be down to fight. And then I would just have it in the back of my mind, like, okay, uh, a couple of these guys would be down to fight. And if it made sense, I'd go up to them and ask them. And then the thing is, other guys do the same thing so they know you're down. And if they come up to you and ask, and there's nothing, if it makes sense, I'm always down. Kind of idea. As I got older, I wasn't allowed to as much. How do you uh, how do you ask that? Uh, excuse me, sir. Would you uh, would you please like to drop the glove? And I've had some of the craziest. Like sometimes I'd be opening face off, and I'd go up to a guy. Like let's say it's a away game. I'd be like, "Hey, man, let's fight." He'd be like, "No." I'd be like, "Come on, man. Like let's go." He'd be like, "No." I'm like, "He'd be like, man, please. Like like listen. Like your coach. Your coach doesn't care. Start of the game. He's like, all right, okay. Like some of them are like that. Like a bunch of the ones where you're square off on face offs. It's like it's nothing. And there's other times where you're obviously making some threats it really depends on the situation but yeah sometimes i'm like just politely hey man do you want to fight later okay sounds good like that's that's it just like making dinner plans eh? like hey you want to go to five guys after uh, after this match or what oh oh man some, it's, sometimes it's the most polite thing ever i'm like hey like do you want to fight and it's like okay yeah sure like in warm-ups and stuff other times you're like ripping like yelling at them and whatever but a lot of times like it's really like in warm-up i'll see a guy in the red line and then he'll try to get my attention and then be okay, yeah, like if it makes sense, and then you say okay. And then during a shift, they'll come up to you, tap you, and say, hey, let's go. And then, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I mean, there's got to be a lot of mutual respect because it's not an easy role to handle, right? I mean, there's a lot of pressure with it, and a lot goes into it, right? So, I mean, obviously, if you got a guy who's similar doing the same thing, there's some level of, yeah, okay, we're one of the same. Yeah, so when I was, when I, when I was 17, 18, I'd fight anybody. If anyone wanted to fight, I'd fight them. But then when I was getting, when I was like 19, 20 year old, like I'd get in trouble for, for fighting guys that weren't like getting any points and stuff. So then that's the only time I'd get really frustrated. But yeah, like when you're two guys that are both like 17 or 18, you guys both know like, okay, like I need to get a fight in here to like, when you understand, like when you're kind of on that same level, yeah, there's definitely a more of a respect factor. 
but then again at the same time like if you're 17 like i'd try to go after 20 year olds i wasn't really being distracted like being respectful and they're not respectful back but there's like that kind of like that respect zone but then it's, but they don't always fall under that yeah and i guess too i mean i'll assume now if you're a 17 year old and you're Point production is probably not the same as a 20 year old because obviously it's tough to be an OA in junior. Like there's only three spots. So typically those guys are putting up a lot of fights. So if you can kind of sit for five minutes and, you know, when you look at the comparison, it's you as a 17 year old who might not be putting up in terms of point production. And now you've got a 20 year old who's, you know, averaging almost a point and a half per game sitting in the box on the other side with you. Your coach is probably pretty happy with you, but on the other side, he's probably infuriated. Yeah, well, yeah, so I, I got to see both sides of that through, throughout, right? So I started at the beginning where, like, whoever I could fight was good. And then by the end, it was, like, all these new guys that are trying to fight you and stuff. And it's, like, you're almost in, a, like, a lose-lose situation, right? Like, mm-hmm. if you fight them and you pump them and you're a 20-year-old, you look bad, you're already getting in trouble for not – you're getting in trouble for fighting and now sitting in the box. Even if you win the fight, you look bad. And then if you lose the fight, you look even worse. So, yeah, like, when you're – when you're 17 and 18, like, yeah, you have nothing to lose. But as you get older, it's a bit more like you get to pick and choose the right ones. Who were some of the guys that, you know, looking back on, if you can remember any that you were like, yeah, we had some really good tilts. Uh, I know this guy, Aaron Hoyles, he played on uh, Blaineville. Me and him would fight like every single preseason game. And then I think we still fought like four times in regular season. Uh, who else do we have some good fights with? Um, oh, uh, Jeremy Frazier. <laughs> he played at Carlton too. Me and him fought it like, I think three or four times. Um, me and Sam Moran always had a had beef, but he absolutely would pump me. He's fucking like six, nine, like giant. Uh, but yeah, like more, more or less, like, yeah, like I'd say the guy fought the most big like Hoyles or Frazier. Fought them a few times each. Um, What's kind that? of quite a bit of everybody. What's it like later in uh, your career joining crossing paths and being teammates with uh, guys that you used to fight so often? Well, see, that's the thing. Like you said, like you do have that respect. Like me and him are actually like, pretty good buddies <laughs> when, you know, when we're on the same team, like right away. It's uh, we joke around and like make fun of each other a bit about it, but it's at the same time, it's like we have a, real, a really similar personality too. Right. And, like we, so, we get each other on that level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, playing in Gatineau, you know, being so close uh, to, I guess, because you haven't really left the area in a sense, you know, you're still in Ottawa. I mean, what's it, uh, obviously, that's got to be a little bit of a testament to how much you enjoyed your time in Gatineau. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, like, I loved Gatineau. Like, that's such a good, such a good, like, environment there. Like, like, that place full is, like, one of, like, the crazy, like, it's one of those things where, like, when you're playing on Gatineau and it's, like, a full rink and it's third period and you're down a goal, it's, like, you, you have that such a good crowd momentum there you're, or if you're up a goal it's just it's that was like one of my favorite places to play I loved it there uh, tell me a little bit about Pajot because you got like 20 games in playing uh, around him because I'm curious what he was like in junior yeah so I was actually lucky like I guess that was my year I got a lot of my points and it was when I was playing playing with him uh they put they'd always put me with some more of the skilled guys because I was able to keep up and like dish them the puck but also like be on there for if anyone does do cheap shots or anything like that. Uh, and for him, he's just so fast, man. Like it's one of those things where like, I, I'd be a wing. So then my, like I'd get it on the, on the boards and I would just chip it off the glass and just know he's going to get a breakaway, you know, or like if I was doing PK with him, it's like he would get a breakaway and I just put my head down, skate as hard as I can. If he like hits the post or if it's like sitting on the line, I would just like get the free tap and he was a, like a hard working guy. Like he's, he's like a guy that wants you to do well. So like, I'm happy to see him do well. He's a really good guy and a hard worker. Like he's, he's a solid guy. Yeah. I'm excited to see what the future holds with him. And uh, you know, really, I, I guess he's been with the Isles now for a, a little bit, but one of my favorite Ottawa memories was that playoff run where uh, they went real deep and he had like the four goal game or whatnot that, that year with uh, where they lost eventually in the conference finals to Pittsburgh and like, and the OC transfer just filled the buses though with uh, after that game where he like went lights out and everybody's just chanting Pajot, 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 yeah. man. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that was sweet. Yeah, that was like, I remember that game too. I like, guess that was wild. So after, you know, your time at Gatineau, there's a season where you're split with uh, Bathurst and the Ramparts. 
Uh, so tell me about those uh, years. Cause I mean, Bathurst have, you know, recently been an organization with a, a few uh, successes, obviously with the recent Mem Cup there a few years ago now. And then, uh, yeah, the Ramparts as well. Uh, yeah. So Bathurst, like, so I ended up going from Gatineau to Bathurst, like Bathurst uh, traded probably way too much for me. Like after my good year of Gatineau there, like they, they like traded a lot for me. And then the issue with Bathurst was like, cause I did well, like I was almost at a point per game and stuff the year before that. Uh, they were really trying to put me in a role that wasn't for me. Like I was playing the point on the power play and I came and skate backwards. Like it was kind of a, it was kind of a mess. Like I didn't really like the GM there was, was awesome. But like, like, I don't know the coach at the time, I just didn't really like it. It was like, we were there in like a rebuilding kind of phase. And uh, at that time, and like, I don't know, we just would lose games and no one really cared. And it was really frustrating. So I asked for a trade, <laughs> uh, but then Quebec was awesome. Like Quebec is incredible. Like the, the rink is unreal. Like the facilities, the fans, it's, you're basically like playing in the NHL there. Like they have more fans in Florida. Like <laughs> it is, it is, it's like an incredible experience to see that and like playing the Coliseum too. So when you're kind of in an unfortunate situation like that, where, you, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you're kind of losing games and people aren't caring too much and you're not a big, big fan of the coach. I mean, obviously you go and ask for a trade, but like that's easier said than done. How are you working up the courage to, you know, request something like that? See, that's another thing, man, that is like, I didn't have any like hockey, like mentors. So like when I, if I have kids that play junior and stuff, it's like junior, you can only get traded like Christmas and then end of the season kind of idea, like during the summer. Mm-hmm. don't ask for a trade in October <laughs> like like don't do that but uh honestly man I was so fed up like I was so I was so over it like like the coach at the time like we'd lose three we got waxed three games in a row the last one's against Keith Brett and we lost like 6-1 and then I go back to the bus like after the game the coach is already back there like dealing out cards and I'm like man like we just got waxed like we just got to score the last three games like 17 to three and now we're jumping on this bus here and it should be dead silence like I, like I hate losing and then the the, the coach is just back there like already down to play cards with the older guys and like come on like after that as soon as I got back there I'm like hey I can't keep doing this like it was just rubbing like I don't want to become like that loser mentality so the next day I went in there which again I'd wait till the summer next time but <laughs> <laughs> I went in there and like went to the GM I'm like hey like I don't want to I don't want to play here anymore like it sucks losing I hate losing and we're not gonna win um with how it is and like that year obviously they did poorly um they did change everything around though after that but yeah like it was uh yeah I was scared for sure though doing that at the time what was the GM's initial response because I mean obviously he's got to feel a little bit betrayed he just gave up so much for you and then you know half a season now you're on your way out again uh he was nice though man uh his name uh what's uh what's his name he plays on philadelphia his dad um sylvan Boutte, i don't know what's his last name uh his, his son has the orange hair he's playing philadelphia not not drew obviously um just can't remember his name but he, he's part owner of the team is uh i'm definitely not going to remember the name like <laughs> he's, he's, he's a good player but he was he was he was nice man like he kind of like he kind of like understood i guess i don't know it wasn't anything too crazy like he was more laid back than than like other people had so like he like he was pretty okay with it yeah well that must have been like definitely reassuring for you made that a little bit easier yeah yeah like overall like but like at the end of the day though still all of november and the rest of december i basically would get dressed and barely play because the coach knew I asked for a trade. So I really shot myself in the foot there. Like mm-hmm. it, it was kind of like a bad, like after doing that, it was, my life was kind of held for a bit. So I was really happy to get out of there. How are you trying to compensate and not make it as hellish as possible throughout that, uh, those few months? Cause at the end of the day too, you still want to try and put together some good tape and highlights. Man, it was, it was tough. Like my billets at the time were, were really supportive like I was having a hard time mentally at like during that like no November and just as like shortly after getting there like the whole time I was there like my billets were were awesome like I got really into hunting and, and stuff while I was there but like honestly man like going to the rink and stuff like I wasn't I wasn't really enjoying it at all yeah it's unfortunate when you're in a moment of despair for things that you're so passionate about 
yeah i was that was like one like i was yeah like that was one of the better times in my life for sure i hated like i just couldn't wait till christmas uh, i'm curious though what were you uh what were you hunting in uh bathers uh partridge and then we went moose hunting once and deer hunting it was man it was awesome like that was mm-hmm. a good experience like like my bills there were, were incredible and like that was really helped out a lot you got to come out to Newfoundland if you're uh, interested in hunting, man. Have you you haven't been out this way yet, have you? No, I haven't, man. But like I've played with so many guys from out there that they, I think I'm gonna come down there to go for the was it George Street? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So like I I think I might make it on my list one day. Like like again, like I have quite a few buddies who play who are from out there. So who uh, who have you played with from out here? Uh, Etchigari, Donahue, who else is there? Um, Dylan's out there. There's a bunch of new. Oh. Uh, Don, he's like my like one of my better buddies from there. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know Kurt Gary too, or no? No, you're not naming off uh, a few uh, names that I'm from. You're a couple years older than me, eh? Not, you're 94. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a 97. I'm trying to think now. So there is a little bit of overlap in. Uh, potential. Yeah, they were, a lot of the a lot of the Newfoundland guys play in St. John, eh? Like the growlers there now or uh, no, it's just like the sea dogs a lot of the newfoundland guys were on sea dogs remember that mm-hmm. yeah there's um well i mean there's currently right now there's uh liam leonard's on the sea dogs he's from uh he's from home that era yeah the sea dogs had nathan knoll at one point yeah he was buddies with cody and them too like yeah, yeah yeah so there's a yeah there's a little bit of overlap for sure i'm sure if we like really kind of separated the put down the spreadsheet we'd find some yeah. uh oh, yeah uh, so you gotta now i even wrote this down because it was a little bit confusing and you gotta break this season down for me so the 2014 2015 year ramparts drummondville then you're in the mj uh m yeah mjhl with the valley wildcats and then you're also with brampton in the echl all throughout that year so that 2014 2015 season was definitely a wild ride how like how in the hell did that happen yes yeah, so i started the year out in Quebec. Mm-hmm. um and I, I i started out really well like i think i had like 12 points or nine points and whatever like almost po- like a point per game um and then we had four oh eight, so we were rotating 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 um and then i ended up going to um valley i was there for like two weeks or three weeks maybe and then went back to quebec and then i got traded to drummondville at christmas because again we had four eight four oh eights again yeah, that's like I'm surprised you guys actually started the season before always. It was yeah, it was a it was a bit of a mess there. It was it was a lot going on. Like it was it was a lot on all of us. Like every guy would just like, oh, it's weird to be in that position again after like doing that when you're 16, right? Like, oh, who's mm-hmm. playing? Kind of idea when you're not really in the lineup. So it was uh, it was definitely like all of us were like like buddies and stuff, but it was definitely like an awkward situation for us to all be put into. Um, well, it's such a important year because I mean you're trying to whether it's grab a pro deal or anything, right? Like even uh, university hockey. Yeah, I don't know all the fine details on on that. I just know there were some some things that were going on for sure. Uh, and then yeah, like I went to Drummondville, and again it was it was it was fun overall. Like it was it was good to like finish out, and then as soon as I was done, I just signed with Brampton. Like like a couple days after, I signed the coast. So how, how'd that feel? I mean, obviously that's got to be a pretty special moment. Yeah, no, that was, that was fun. Like that was an awesome experience. Like I got there, uh, I got there on like Friday and then played a game Friday night and then I uh, had my first pro fight uh, that night. Um, and then Saturday we went on like 13 day road trip, like all through Texas and basically, well, you know, it was in the, in the coast, like everywhere. Um, Got, it was it was awesome, man. Like it was a lot of fun. I got my first pro goal. Uh, overall, like that was an incredible experience. Like we lived in a nice place downtown. It was it was a really good way to like kind of finish like a weird year. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's almost like a little bit of a, a reward after everything that you've had to go through to get to that point. Yeah, well, it was, it was a battle, right, man? Like going from all over the place, like even going down to Valley and then playing in the East Coast in the same same season. I guess just kind of shows like I wasn't willing to give up, right? Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, even the transition, like you're in Sioux, then you're in Gatineau, then like all over the the queue, right? And now you finally get uh, that little treat. And like you said, even the Valley, right? It's definitely a lot of grit and uh, 
kind of attests to a little bit of the character and the play style too. Yeah, well, at the time, man, I was really like, it was, yeah, at the time it was mentally tough, but I don't know. I always felt like if I kept pushing at it, it would work out. So like, I'm, like, again, like I was really happy to finish here in coast and like do well when I was there. Like it was, it was awesome to be there, honestly. Did you, uh, you win that f- first pro fight? How'd that one go? Man, I was so happy. Okay. <laughs> this is a good story. So my first, my first time I ever got absolutely dummied was like in a fight was I was in the Sioux and it was against Ben Thomas. I don't know if you, I, don't, I think he plays in the NHL or played in the NHL. He was a big boy. And when I asked him to fight on a faceoff, he's like, are you sure you want to do that? Right. That's what he said to me. And I said, yeah, like, let's, let's go. Right. Like, let's fucking go. And then he pumped me, like just absolutely pumped me. Okay. So it's East coast. It's my first shift. I go on. And again, I looked at drop your gloves, looked to be down to fight. I found a guy that's pretty tough. And then I went up to him and skated to him. I tapped him on the pants. I'm like, Lex, I'm like, let's go. Guess what he says? Are you sure you want to do that? I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> like I was like huge deja vu, man. I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, yeah, let's go. So we drop our gloves and we're squaring up. And then he came in like, again, I think he thought he was going to punt me. And then it was just like a, literally like a nice one punch, like drop them like a nice, like he was down. He didn't finish like good, like a nice way to come in. You did a one punch knockout. Oh man. He just, yeah. He came in like really, again, he was really cocky. He's like, Oh, you sure you want to do that? And he skated in really good. And the back of my mind, I'm like, yo, I can't get pumped. Like it was like, <laughs> you know, it's like, we're just like in a movie just as like a cutaway to like the flashback. And I was just, I don't know. I just had the adrenaline going, man. I just punched him. Like, I wouldn't say it was a knockout, but it took him a good like five, five, ten minutes to to leave the ice. Like he was, uh, it was, I was fired up about that for sure. And it was a spa- uh, Star Wars game too. <laughs> <laughs> nice little theme uh, to it, eh? Like uh, I'm sure, yeah. well, what's actually probably nice about that is, uh, you know, in the coast, obviously crowds fluctuate a lot of times. So if it's a theme game, especially like Star Wars, you probably had a pretty good crowd. Yeah, I assume, I mean, it's pretty good. I assume like, it was uh it was fun like it was that like playing in Brampton was a lot of fun it was cool to see like kind of how the coast was like it also showed me something I like oh, I don't want to do this for forever you know yeah. but it was it was fun to be there and like have nothing to lose really like it was I got ice like I said I got a, got my goal got a couple got a fight in there it was it was good well it's almost like you get the little taste of it and now you're like hey uh, this is this is enough for me right and you get to leave with like you said you know professional hockey goal like there i can guarantee you there's a lot of players who went through a whole hockey career and never got the chance to score a pro goal right so i mean the fact that you got one and uh you know you get the fight in because obviously that was a lot of uh a testament to your play style and how you played the game right it's a nice little cherry on top essentially oh yeah man it was yeah overall like it was it was like again it was it was a like a happy way to end like a like a good but also like challenging like five years of junior mm-hmm any uh any other good coast stories? I mean, uh, some of the coast stories are actually like my favorite. Just hearing and, and chatting with a, a bunch of different guys. Man, you know Benoit grew like he was Team Canada's coach there for a bit. Mm-hmm. He was he's someone that like I I love him because he would push you. Like I was there for the two years I was there. I think he said good job like three times to you. Like he's not like a he's he's the next level man. Like if you put a if you put a hidden camera in there like. It, <laughs> Like it would be nuts, man. Like the like it would go it would go all over like viral, like just the amount of stuff that goes on. Um, one of the a couple of, I could tell you stories about him for days, but one of them was uh, we were on a like a one of the East Coast road trips. So our last game was in Cape Breton. It was like our fourth game in like six days or whatever it was, like one of those long trips. Mm-hmm. And we blew like a two goal lead, but we still went three three wins and a loss on the trip. And we get back to the uh, to the rink here. 5.30 in the morning, 16-hour trip from Cape Breton to here. We get, we get there. We get, we're on the bus. The whole way home, it's dead silent. Like, it's, like, when I say dead silent, like, lights can't be on. Like, we'd have to eat. <laughs> when we'd lose a game, you'd have to wait for, like, street like street lights to go by to, like, see to eat your food. Like, that's how, like, that's how it was with him. We get there at 5.30 in the morning. He's, like, everybody in the room. Again, I'll cut up all the swearing and stuff. We get to the room and then we had to put on our workout stuff, running around the rink at 5.30 in the morning. And he's sitting there in his car watching us. We did a practice, a workout, went home, and had to go back the same day for another workout after a 16-hour bus trip, man. It was like stuff like that. We went through like three or four projectors that year. (laughs) 
one of the guys on the team, he would, uh, he would never stop. Like he would always like circle a bit, um, like instead of full on stopping. And then he one time made him like stand up and he was circling his belly with the uh, laser pointer, uh, like just like circling him and then circling the, the, the video screen and then circling him. And he's like, okay, hey, get the fuck out of here. Like go run the stairs. Like guys, guys are just like, like, yeah, like we would do so many, he was like the one of the hardest, but again, like after, after like having someone like that, it's just like, you really realize how hard you can push yourself and anyone else the rest of your life just seems soft compared to that. Mm -hmm. No, it's definitely, it, it's wild. Right. And I mean, I guess sometimes it's trying to find the fine line of, you know, what's pushing too far, but what also gets the most out of the guys. Right. Cause I guess it's never really exactly written in the stand in the sand for one individual, right. Everybody's different. Oh, he was, he's on like TSN top 10 coach meltdowns and everything. Like he's thrown stick racks, garbage cans on the, like he's literally like cleared everything he can. Like even just like little things like one day we're at practice and he goes to like right on the like it's again it's a monday morning like it's 7 30 in the morning it's like you know what i mean like who has that much like built up anger in them and then he goes to draw the drill on the board and the marker's not working like the sharpie whatever like the rifle marker goes to grab another one it's not working he yells for the trainer he's like it's like a he's a volunteer guy he's like 70 he just kind of like fills the water and stuff and then he comes out and then he gets the marker he whiffs at him it's like be ready for practice. He was just like one of those guys who take guys' sticks, just throw them into the crowd and say, like, don't come back on the ice. Like just like stuff like that. But like he was good. Like he made me better and made me stronger. But but he's uh he's next level. Yeah, that's uh it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't know if I condone uh <laughs> I definitely don't condone throwing a, a Sharpie marker at a 70 year old, but <laughs> no, like he that's how it man, he was just over like he was just always ready to just, like go, man. I've never seen anyone get angry or like he's, he could be really mean too. Like, but again, at the end of the day, like he would, he'd make people better who were willing to take it. The point that you said with on the bus waiting for the streetlights, that kills me because I don't think people understand how just maybe the worst atmosphere ever in sport is the bus on an, a road game so you're driving back after you either got pumped or just lost in general like i i've been on a few of those buses and, it, and it's just not fun like especially as a support staff like you want to sit down shut up not get in anybody's way whatsoever and it's already the thing is too is man the fact that you guys couldn't use lights like those lights don't help that much yeah. either it's, it's already hard to see well man that the it was like we were driving back from like rune naranda where it's like there aren't really that many street lights. So it's like taking you like an hour and a half to eat your meal. Like, man, like you're literally like this, like looking like, man, I'm not even like, it was no phones. No, like they would take our phones. Like they wouldn't let us have our phones and stuff. Like you'd literally just sit there and just like, like this, like whisper over to like the guy beside you and just hope to God no one hears it. Oh man. And I'm sure too, the, the post-game meals are a lot of chicken and rice, which is absolutely impossible to eat on the bus. So you, once you finally get there and the lights come on, you're probably just smothered with a bunch of shit. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> man, he was like, like, man, even just like we get up at any hotel when you get up for breakfast, like you have to be down there, like hair, like if you came down there with hair, like mine is right now, like you're getting sent back up to the room. Like if you get off the bus, like let's say we finish a game in Monk and you go to Halifax, you're getting in there at like two in the morning. If you get off and like, you're like some guys one time had their ties half undone and stuff. And all those guys had to go to the, go to the rink and unpack the bags and help the trainers out. Like he was. Like, he that, was that's kind of a nice punishment though. At least, uh, you know, the trainers get a little bit of uh, a slack in their duties. Yeah. But it's, he, he ran it like he runs it like just strict, strict, strict. But again, like it teaches you a lot, like a lot of discipline. I gotta be honest. I'm not too, what was, I'm not too familiar with him. I'm trying to, I mean, he coaches Syracuse now. Pardon me? He coaches Syracuse now, I believe. He uh, yeah. he coached Team Canada for, like, when Duclair and uh, Ernie – not Ernie, Ernie's on Team USA. Like, Duclair and – who else was on the team then? Like, a few of the other guys. Like, Team Canada, like McKinnon and all them. Mm -hmm. He was head coach then for Team Canada. So, af after all this now, so you're – this is one of the weirdest team names I've ever seen in my life. It's, like, named after a snake. So the Columbus Cotton Mouths, they they fold it now because they. I was looking into them. They couldn't find a, a new owner, but you had a little stint 
with them. So like, what can you tell me about that? Cause I, I don't even know what to even say about that. <laughs> man, that was, man, I honestly loved living there. Like yeah, that was, eh? man, it was, it was beautiful, bro. It was like lizards and snakes are, well, obviously like it's, it was like two and a half hours from like Panama city, Florida. Like it was, it was awesome, man. Like I loved, I literally loved living there. It was, it was fun. It was good. Like it was, yeah, it was awesome. Like the owners owned uh, Aflac insurance and they were like, like her name's Wanda, like absolute sweetheart. Like it was, that was a really good experience too. Like that was, that was a lot of fun. And then uh, that's where I had like my uh, bad concussion too. So that's kind of how I ended up at Carlton. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like what was, uh, what was the hockey like there? It was, it was like, that's the thing, man. It's like when you're, there's some guy, like the, when you get into the pro and that's something that guys that, have, that play pro real, like you don't realize that until you're playing pro. It's like, there's guys at every, like between AHL all the way down to the SP, like there's guys on every team who could be interchanged with one another because everyone's so, so similar. Like when I was in, uh, I, when I went from Brampton, I was in Toledo and it's like, there's guys on Toledo that are averaging point over a point per game every, like for last season, like MVP of the season, but they're on this like three year deal, like a two way deal. And then the AHL has no space for them. And then now they're just stuck in playing the coast. So mm -hmm. they're, it's, it's kind of like almost it's man. It's literally like guys that there's guys on the coast that should be in the SP. There's guys in the SP that should be in the coast. There's guys in the A that should be like, it's one of those things where it's like, it's very like, between the coast and the SP, it's, there's obviously like slight differences, but the man, it's one of those things where it's really like, it's there's being good and stuff, but there's so many guys that there's guys I think that in pro that are like at that top, like they're definitely better. But then mm -hmm. there's such a big piece like this here that it's like depends on what team you go to. Depends on there's so many different factors that can come into play on how how your pro journey will go that that is completely out of your control which is something that is really hard about pro yeah no i mean it makes a lot of sense and you hear some stories about it too that are just crazy and sometimes it's just like having that one conversation where you, where guys are like no nah, i'm not gonna go down to the coast like i'm gonna stay here and then like they go on and be stanley cup champions or you know it sometimes it's just as simple as oh okay you miss the bus so now your minutes are reducted by 15 and you're not performing as much or, or things like that right like there's so many different interchangeable things that can really make or break a career right and once you get to that level yeah a lot of people are on the same kind of uh, trajectory essentially and and skill set yeah the, the differences between guys that like even in the coast it's like like hockey like and i especially hockey like it's one of those things where it's it is kind of like there's a lot of luck involved and in like kind of going to the right team, like with that, that likes who you are. Like other, some teams guys do terrible and they get traded and then they do unreal. Right. Like mm -hmm. a lot of little things can come into play that determine your success that are out of your control. Now you mentioned you had your back concussion in Columbus. Did you get that from fighting or was that like a hit or something like that? Yeah, no, that was fighting. So I was like absolutely feeding this guy uppercuts. Mm -hmm. Like he was just like turtled, like, kind of like giving up i guess and then he did the like pull your pants it's it's you're you're not allowed to do it like you get suspended for like i think it's like seven games doing that like it's banned in the nhl it's banned in every kind of hockey mm -hmm. and he did that and had no helmet on and then i hit my head off the ice and then i went to the penalty box there's only like five and a half minutes left of the game and then at the end of the game the coach was like talking in the room and then i started having convulsions okay so to the hospital i was there for like four days what's the thought process there immediately like are you kind of recognizing that like shit i'm i'm in trouble uh well i was in the penalty box i kept trying i kept like really like falling asleep like almost falling asleep that whole five minutes but then i was in the room i just like okay i've like i definitely like hurt my head or something but then when i started having convulsions i don't remember any of that like i just remember like the ambulance had to come and then i was in the hospital like i was it was bad man like it was really really bad like i was like like on like uncontrollably like shaking it was crazy when you come to and you realize what's happened what's the thought process there i mean is it a lot of fear or are you like can i play hockey anymore like what's yeah like yeah like it's one of those things where i'm like okay like like 
the like the doctor there was like no like no more hockey this year like if anything you should probably just stop playing hockey um so that was obviously like really hard on me um like that was like devastating honestly and then at that point I was like okay like I might as well go go try out school because I'm not gonna play hockey the rest of this year so then I end up coming to Carleton and I mean so now I guess is that because I was going to ask essentially how you got to Carleton and why you chose Carleton and committed to the Ravens Uh, obviously that path isn't as like clear cut which is you know pretty on trend for yourself there so essentially I guess what's the big reason why you continued to play hockey at Carleton well even so even when I was in Brampton and like seeing so I remember like after we were like doing this that huge long road trip I see guys that have done their school and then went to the coast Mm -hmm. they were the guys that were able to sit on the bus and like have fun and play cards still or whatever like still like live a normal life it was the guys that were now 26 27 that went right from junior to pro is what is that's what I was planning on doing to be honest with you was just like I'm like yo screw school like I don't care about school like no one was telling me to go to school and then after seeing like the difference in like mental stability of the guys that had something to fall back on versus the guys that didn't I'm like okay like I would consider going to school kind of idea like maybe I'll try it out for a year in the coast again and then and then do the school because you lose your scholarship after a year right Mm -hmm. so so it was in the back of my mind that I might go back and, and do school. So then when I had that concussion, I was like, clear cut. Okay, might as well just go try it out. And if I don't like it, I can just come back next year if I feel feel up to it. Um, but then I got, came to Carleton and I loved it. I, I went to see a bunch of schools. Like I did that whole school tour thing with my brother. Um, we went to like seven or eight different schools. Um, I, after a year of junior, like four, before we both went to pro. And uh, I chose Carleton because... Um, the coaches there were like uh, Marty and uh, Medzi, like I could tell they just wanted the best for me. Like they knew I kind of went through a lot of shit in my life and kind of had a bit of a, I was dealing with some of my own, some of my own issues and they were really there to like support me and, and stuff like that. And then my best friend, uh, David Weckworth, he was, he was going there. So I was just at such like a tough, tough point in my life then that I knew that like being around people that are care about my best interest, my, and like my girlfriend at the time lived here. So I think it was just like, I'm like, okay, like if I'm going to be trying to build myself back up from who I am right now, that I need to go to a place like that. But there was, that was kind of the main reason. And so now you get there is like, so hockey was on your mind right away, correct? To go to Carleton? Yeah. Yeah. That was the plan all along, like to do, like to do physio and, and get back for next year. Okay. When you return after something like as traumatic as that, like, are you a completely different player or how are you trying to combat that? At first it was a bit like a bit like kind of nervous thing. And like Dr. Taylor, uh, the the team doctor at Carlton, like she was really like cautious on me and like a bit worried too. Um, But honestly, after like a few times just getting hit hard and stuff, like I was like, okay, I'm fine. I kind of forgot about it. But like the first like couple of times, if someone like went for my head, I'd kind of get pissed. But then after that, I forgot about it, whatever. So now tell me about just, you know, once you get into that rhythm, what's, uh, how's life in Carleton? Yeah, I love Carleton, bro. Like, Car- like I, I honestly, like, Carleton was awesome. Like, winning is, winning is fun. And, like, again, like, a lot of, like, playing at Carleton was like, my favorite hockey in my life. That's, like, Carl- like, Carleton was the most fun, like, the closest I've been with the guys. Uh, just overall, like, doing university hockey and, um going to school and just that entire environment was was incredible like it was fun to win uh going out with the boys on saturday if you win both like stuff like like it's different than junior it's different than pro and it it was my favorite time playing hockey honestly what's the ravens bar what was the ravens bar choice (laughs) there's whiskey bro yeah (laughs) whiskey (laughs) is it Dubé works there. He used to be the be goalie for Carlton. So like basically wherever Dubé goes, that's where the Carlton guys follow still to this day. It was whiskey. I was never like a huge whiskey guy, but again, it was like after Saturday game, it'd be like the t- 25 guys. And then they would all have, basically everyone there would be with Car- like with Carlton. So like, it was fun, but Wh- again, they, they just play the same playlist over and over again. <laughs> whiskey. It definitely grows on you. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. Like, like, man, honestly, at this time of the year, like I've never been a big, big bar guy, yeah. but I'd do anything to go out to whiskey night with the boys, man. Seriously. <laughs> uh, 
you make uh, the all-star OUA rookie team that year after your first year at Carleton. I mean, that's got to be a special moment, no? After everything you've gone through in junior and then, you know, having that traumatic experience in the last kind of stages of pro and then getting back there and then getting recognition in terms of like a skill set. Yeah, yeah, no, like I think that was, yeah, I actually completely forgot about that. But yeah, no, like at the time I was really, I was really like happy about that. Um, I think I was still disappointed that we didn't go as far as expected. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was obviously happy to like kind of get recognized for that and also know that because uh, the coach is there and like even the guys and the Dr. Taylor and everyone had to like help me out so much. Like I was there for eight months getting, getting full. Uh, is it still working? It's, yeah, yeah, I'm still here. So. Um, getting like they were going above and beyond to help me out so being able to like obviously like produce and also get recognized for it um was like a good way to like repay them I guess and like thank them for everything they did for me just everybody mm -hmm. who was in my life that supported me through all that no it's definitely I mean it's got to be the a nice little icing on the cake so now you play two more seasons after that that's got to be a uh a, like almost an interesting way to kind of finish it all off or yeah 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 no like I I was did like again I enjoyed all three of my years there like I, I absolutely loved it um and then I, like I did classes like I always did like classes in the summer and stuff to get ahead uh because originally I was thinking I didn't want to go play pro again um that was the plan like oh, either go play in Europe or go play in the east coast but then by like my midway through my third year even like a little bit before that I was kind of like finding other interests, like doing like, honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, like I love, like a, a really important thing to me all along, even since I was a kid, like playing hockey, I thought that was the only way I could like make money and like make something of myself. So when I started excelling at something else, where it was more of like a for sure path to success, if I put the work in, I started like gravitating towards that. And like, again, like I loved playing at Carleton. So ending on a positive note versus like, going somewhere not liking it and stuff and I'd rather just leave hockey on like a good note mm -hmm. no it's definitely gotta be nice and I guess those other interests now for you too is um like business yeah are, are you the one with the story with like the the housing and like renting or am I thinking of someone else like renting the rooms at and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that you <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's a man that's a legendary story i've heard that st i've uh, personally i've heard that story from like four different people yeah like like, uh, like house hacking it yeah yeah so i mean you want to give uh, the listeners some context yeah so if you want us if you want to save money in school rent out a five-bedroom house like rent out like a rent out whatever house you're going to rent out let's say it's twenty five hundred dollars a month go to the landlord and again at the time i was making like money doing my business in school so then you just go to landlord, if it's $2,500 rent, you say, hey, I'll give you 2,300 or 2,200. In my case, it gave me 2,100. And I'll give you six months in advance and I'll deal with any of the bullshit. And as a landlord, they're like, they'd rather take that than having to hound people down and deal with little things. So then you just like, you're in charge of the lease and then you can just release it. It's, uh, I, you're definitely, man, it's kind of funny because the way that you tell that and it's like the way it's been like, recite it to me it's funny because you can tell when like how like stories kind of get ahead of themselves and like when i've heard it, it <laughs> well, i gotta keep it i gotta keep it a little uh under your laps you can do that well, you can do that for more than the place you live at let's just say that yeah yeah you can do it to uh you can rent out more than one place right so like mm -hmm. like you can have two four bedrooms and like like renting a four bedroom down the street and then charging everyone 700 and then just picking the money up and giving it to the landlord, keeping the difference is it's good little, good little hustle, man. Yeah. Side hustle. So when did you, cause you've been, obviously you got your own business and things like that. So when did you start to recognize that? Like, Oh, Hey, like I like kind of being in business for myself and that entrepreneurship landscape. Uh, after my first year doing it, man, like it was after like I started doing like, again, like right when I got to Carlton, I wasn't playing hockey. So I was started doing that. Like it was like a, I had like a mentor teach me how to do it. And I just did so well that first year that I did it all the way through university. And then I was like, yo, I'm making bank well in school and playing hockey. And like, like I said, doing an overload classes. I'm like, yo, I'm already making good money. Imagine if I had 
full time to go into this. So as soon as I graduated, I was like, I just like bought out my non compete and just went full tilt. Fair enough. Yeah. Has it has it been so far? So I mean, explain what you're doing now exactly. So we do like we do home services. So I started with just window and gutter cleaning and power washing. That's what we were only doing in university. And then as soon as I graduated, I went to uh, driveway ceiling and Christmas lights. And now we do lawn care. So we're doing a uh, subscription based for most of the people now. And um, yeah, we just kind of our biggest, biggest money makers are our biggest services are driveway ceiling and Christmas lights. Okay. Yeah. And that that's interesting to me because a lot of like, you wouldn't think that like Christmas lights, you know, having someone come and put that up for you would be almost a market for it. But you've obviously determined that there is like it's it's the demand is insane like if someone's like oh like because we, we do a thousand dollar minimum someone's like oh that's too expensive it's okay like like there's no there's no uh, bartering like there's so much demand for it it's it's mind-blowing now i think uh because you've been you know we've chatted a little bit about like tiktok and things of that nature and i don't mean to pry too much but i i remember seeing a tiktok that you were talking about like here's like tips or like how to grow to like a six figure business or whatnot. So you're operating now at like th- that capacity. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like my, our 2021 goal is to do a million. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, Good for you. Goal, man. But like, it's, 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 uh, I, again, I came through other things and made it. So that's the 2021 goal this year is to, is to hit a million. Man, best of luck with you with that, with that. I definitely think you can do it. Um, I'm, I'm curious now though, like, uh, we're kind of getting more into business now, which is fine. Cause that's kind of the pathway of like your life essentially. So what are some like tips and suggestions that you really think goes into operating and scaling a business to that six figure. And then obviously with your goal of hitting a million. The most, well, for my business, the most important thing is your team, right? If you're mm-hmm. providing a service, you, you can't build a million dollar service, but you can't build a six figure service business without having a good team, like not having good workers on there. So, um, that's the most important and most important thing. And then after that is, is just being like committed to it. Like it, it, I work crazy, like not an unhealthy amount of hours, obviously right now, that's how it is. Like, and I'm down to like eat shit for the next couple of years. So I can, when I do have like a family and stuff, I can like have that financial f- freedom to do what I want. Um, but it's like one of those things like this last year, like I had, um, the goalie for Flint Firebirds, he was working for me and he absolutely excelled. Like anyone that's in sports, that's looking to get into business. um, If you like apply this, your work ethic and like the skill sets you learn in, in sports, you'll do well. Like I want to try to find more people that are in sports that want to work this year. Who was that Flint goalie? Uh, Luke Kavlin. Okay. I was thinking it might've been uh, Popovich or, or whatnot. Is he a C auto guy or? Uh, no, he, uh, I, I could be getting this wrong, but essentially he was at Guelph and, uh, like when, when I was like following the 67th to the OHL final, he was the goalie who, uh, like basically edged us out and they came back and won in, uh, in six. Okay. So then he, I think after that season that he won the OHL cup with, um, Guelph, he was traded to Flint and now he can, I'm pretty sure he's committed to Queens. So that was why I was thinking it might've been him just because Kingston and Ottawa are so close. Uh, so when you said Flint, I wasn't sure if it was him. Cause that, that, uh, that name is just, uh, I was watching some old footage back from that. And it's, it sucks, man. Like when you're, when you're part of like a run and like, obviously you can attest to it more being a player, but like, putting so much time into like a run and then like watching like when we won the Eastern conference uh, finals that uh, year. And like looking back at like my old videos that I took, I was just like, man, like screw Guelph like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It still hurts. Yeah. No, like there's, yeah, it sucks going so far and then not, not getting what you want. Like absolutely, man. Like absolutely kills. Crushes yes. you. I was, uh, I was curious if it, it was him. Cause I'm like that. Uh, he made a couple of big saves in that uh, series. I don't even I don't even know if Popovich is the uh, is the right uh, goalie for it. I almost want to do uh, some research now because I'm like, am I, am I getting this right? But so going into, uh, you know, other aspects, because a part of your business, too, is like you also have a lot in like volunteer and you're always doing like different initiatives and you had like a big one over Christmas and things like that. Tell me all about the different things you're doing there. Yeah, so the big one was this year. It was like my first year doing any like anything really like 
massive, I guess, would be the toy drive for single moms. Um, and that's something that uh, it, it couldn't be, it couldn't, it couldn't have went better, honestly, man. Like the goal was to raise a thousand dollars and use that for toys, but we got so many toy donations and raised twenty five hundred dollars in cash. So it was, it was absolutely incredible to be able to do that. Um, and that's just something like, again, like when I was, when I was a little kid, like I remember, uh, my mom struggling to like make ends meet for my brother and I, and then I literally remember telling myself when I was a kid, like, yo, like I need to like be rich and then be able to like, obviously support for my family and then also make sure that I can give back. So like, again, like by no means right now, I'd say I'm like rich, but like, I, I did well enough this year that, that being able to give back and stuff is, is. I figured why not start now and just keep making it bigger over time um, versus just waiting until I'm whatever level, like what level is that before you start giving back? So I just decided to do it this year. A lot more work than I expected it to all be, but, but I'm, I'm happy how it turned out. No, I love that. Cause I mean, it is true. Like you can definitely find ways to, to give back earlier at like an earlier stage in your life. Like, I mean, I, just graduated from like U Ottawa and I'm still doing my master's now actually. So like, that's kind of still on my plate, but I was just like, okay, yeah, no, like I also have this job and like, obviously like I run my own stuff too and have my own side hustle side business. And it's like, okay, yeah, I can make this make sense. And I can set up this old scholarship at my high school for this amount. And, and it makes sense. Right. So you can definitely get involved and do it early for sure. I get the man. I know you're doing that. Nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't mean to plug my own <laughs> stuff there, but <laughs> it's your podcast plus. Yeah, yeah, but no, it it, it is true. You uh, like it fits with the theme. Like it's just you you go and do it, and you can uh, like it's just you make it make sense. And you know, I look at it, and it's just like okay, well, like if I just the money that I spend in a year, say on like fancy coffee or anything like that, I switch to like you know, an espresso or a curator, just like making it at home, the difference there in itself is enough to afford that annual scholarship. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It it was awesome to get back. And like, it's, it was, it was really nice. Like, like just seeing, like, it was just, it was just weird, right. Like to picture, like when I was a kid, it's just like complete role reversal, like opening a a U-Haul and being like, yeah, like take bikes, take like the switch if you want one. Like, it was uh it was awesome man like there's it was uh it was an emotional day overall yeah eh? I, man i that's got to be an emotional roller coaster like i i can't even imagine like it, it's definitely something uh something special and i'm sure you're looking forward to doing more absolutely man like ab- like yeah like this year like get it set up early and make sure i have to hire a couple people to, to help out with that and stuff mm-hmm. yeah, like, like this will be even better for sure No, I'm I'm excited to see what you end up coming up with. And I want to fixate a little bit more now on your travels, because obviously, like, as I'm preparing for this, I'm stumbling across like uh, some different things. And you were traveling uh, a nice bit, uh, you know, before everything kind of shut down. You were in Thailand in February of 2020, eh? Yeah, I was gone for like six weeks. (laughs) Okay, so you posted a you posted an Instagram. You were like thankful to be be alive what and like your injuries in that photo look absolutely ridiculous like what's the backstory there and that that was that was the most traumatic thing in my life bro like that was by far the most pain i ever was in like like it was it was wild so like uh i was renting a motorcycle and uh i was going like 80 like through the mountains like fast enough right for it to hurt Mm -hmm. i just went like shorts (laughs) <laughs> just shorts um and then um obviously the roads there aren't well kept at all and then I was like once to go to do a, a turn a bit and I just hit some like hit some like loose sand or whatever like a pothole in the road hit loose sand and then you and you're riding your bike and then just slips out from under you mm-hmm. it did that so then I just like did like three or four flips like like just sliding down the hill and then I literally like, by the time I clued in that I was that I crashed I was like upside down and like seeing the pavement like flying underneath me. I ended up landing on my feet like and like running with it a bit and then got missed by got missed by getting hit by a car by like a two one second, half a second. Like if I kept like let's say I hit my head and was knocked out, I would have just rolled all the way into the other like into the incoming traffic on the other side. Like it was it was man, like I caught myself on my feet, ran with it a little bit and then like cuz I had so much speed, I fell again. 
and then like got up and then stopped but like there's a cars like whizzing by on the other side you know it's bad in thailand when they actually people actually stop to like see what's going on because everything else is chaos and they never they never really like care so like it was it was bad man like it was my whole body was road rushed holy smokes man like <laughs> your poor mother <laughs> And it was, it was, I didn't tell her actually for like, okay. I, didn't tell her, I didn't tell her for like three days or something like that until I posted the photo. Yeah, it's just like, hey, almost died, but I'm okay. Here's this, uh, oh, here's the call. She would have like, lost her mind. It was, it was, it was absolutely, it was, man, that whole day. So, so then we go, I didn't want to take an ambulance. I didn't have travel insurance, right? Yeah. They don't cover that anyways. So no, then, I mean, he, uh, sorry, ambulance. I dislocated my kneecap in minor hockey. Like I, I've done it a, a bunch of times, right? And uh, essentially, like my kneecap just doesn't rest like straight on the groove. So mm -hmm. playing like goalie, like it just boom, like would pop out all the time, right? Like once it once it did it the first time in like pee wee, like then it just like continued to happen, right? Yeah, probably not um, a good position to be able to this yeah no definitely not that's probably why i didn't make junior hockey you know i'll write it off on that sure. not the not the eight eight point oh goals against average or anything like that at all Get tough but, <laughs> so yeah freaking um dislocate my knee i'm like lying on the ice they don't really want me to move or anything like that so i'm like okay i'll lie here then they end up calling the ambulance for me our rink was right across the street from like the hospital so it took like an hour and a half for the ambulance to get there for one. So I'm like lit on the, I'm like close to like dying of hypothermia at this point. Cause I'm freezing. Mm. They're like putting a blanket over me. And I'm like, this all just seems like way too much effort and absolutely ridiculous. But it's to the point now too, like our like practice slash like scrim is ruined. Now I'm still lying there. They don't want me to move the next group of like shinny hockey for the men and adults. They're already in the rank being like, who is this idiot? lying on the ice like can we like get them off so we can play like we're paying for like 300 bucks for this ice time right now ambulance comes i get in uh they drive me across the street and then like three weeks later i get a 500 hundred dollar bill it's like no thank you what uh, specter you over there <laughs> yeah i would have been like if that was the case just toss me in the back of a pickup and or should i even roll slash walk over for that brace Right. Yeah. but uh yeah i know so Thai, sorry thailand and ambulances yeah so i just take the motorcycle home like it somehow like the handlebar i had to buy a new motorcycle like, i had to replace the i had to replace it basically mm -hmm. it was working enough to get me back but it was totaled um, <laughs> so i went back to the hotel and then i just like laid on the bed just to like regroup and like the whole room just smells like burning skin man like it was like my entire, like, I'm not even kidding you, man. Like, I'd say, like, 70%. I ended up having a broken collarbone and a high ankle sprain. But then, like, I regrouped there for, like, an hour, just, like, chill out a bit. Go to the hospital, first hospital there. The guy walks in, the, the doctor. They just see you as a money. They just see you as a check, right? Yeah. He comes in and it's like, I've broken a rib before. He basically wanted my whole body MRI and x-rayed. I'm mm -hmm. like, hey, like, just try to round the bill up. I'm like, no, like, just clean them out and give me some antibiotics. I don't get, like have to get amputated in some some place here right um go to leave there they're trying to they, they try to scam me long story short for the purpose of blank they try to scam me at the hospital so i have to like argue my way out of it we only end up paying like a little bit extra versus i signed i signed what i agreed to pay and then you go to leave they charge you like five times more they take the bandages off as like a pity move because like a like a petty move because i didn't want to pay the full amount and then we go back to the hotel and I'm just like, bare, like I'm, I'm mangled, man. And then uh, that night we go across the street to the market because you can only eat like in the market. Like there's not like you don't order stuff in. And then this lady there is like freaking out saying I have to go to the hospital. And then long story short, her, her son is, uh, works at the hospital. He's like an ambulance driver. He picks us up and takes us to like a private, like a Thai hospital mm -hmm. and brings us in. It's an open concept emergency room. Okay, listen to this. So think of like your school, like your elementary school gym. And then think of all the shit that goes on in like an ER of a hospital and then just take away any curtains or any privacy. It's just open. Like it's basically just like an open air emergency room. So we're in there. I'm just like chilling on the bed, waiting for the guy to come over and like 
clean the cuts out and like actually take care of it. The guy on my the guy on my left side here is like I could reach over and touch his bed away from me. They're pumping his stomach, trying to like revive this, like get whatever he OD'd on out of his stomach. On my right side, there's a guy there with like a pole, like right through his shoulder, like right through here, out the other side. They have him just like put to sleep until they have time to like work on him. And then it's me. And then my buddy sitting at the end of my bed there as like, there's like two people like cleaning all my body, like trying to get all like the rocks and stuff out of my body. The guy on my left side, they ends up dying on the table. So his family's in there crying. There's like 10 people around the bed crying. And then it's just me there like chilling. And then my buddy's there on his phone with his stupid little, like got his hair braided. And then on the right side, there's a guy in a pole, like with a pole, literally like right through here. So like, I'm like, yo, so then we end up going to leave then. They get all cleaned up, we go to leave. And there you pay it like you're kind of like paying a bill, or like like you check out kind of idea. Yeah. And the girl at the thing tries to rip me off again. Like she's like, looks at me. She's like, oh, they did this wrong. And then she tries to add like another $400 on the bill. And I'm like, okay, I'll go to the ATM and come back, right? And then we just, we just pee. like, I'm like, I'm not getting scammed again today. And then that night, like I'm just laying in my, I'm just laying in my hotel bed. I'm like, yo, like, motorcycle accident like get scammed at two hospitals literally someone died within arm's reach of me and i'm just like in a like completely different like 12 hour time difference other end of the world i was like man like that was that was probably the craziest day of my life and probably one of the most messed up i'll ever have Uh, that's just so much to unpack i don't even know what (laughs) how to respond to that yeah it was nuts man it was it was it was, yeah, it was one of those things where I was going to bed and I can't believe that was a real, real life. It messed you, up. Like, counting your blessings, like, thank God I'm alive, like, what? <laughs> yeah, man, it was, yeah, it was, like I said, like, if I, like, if I kept going to other lane, I would have got destroyed by a car, like, I would have been done. Yeah. 100%. If you and don't then, mind me asking, how, how much did that end up running you, too, with all the potential scams that you were trying to fight off, basically? uh well like we're replacing the motorcycle and and like the two hospital like mini scams and probably like two grand isn't that bad okay that's so, like, like there's... that's a lot but it's also manageable i guess yeah like they basically like bought how to buy a new, new motorcycle and then both hospitals like the first hospital was a bigger scam the second we ran out on yeah so it was like it wasn't too bad but it was it was traumatic day man like i still have like See my tattoo is like missing pieces in yeah. it. And then it's like faded up here. And it was, it was, man, it was, it was by far the most pain I've ever been in my life. The group of guys that you went over with, what, what are they thinking? Well, I went there with my brother. So he was there for 10 okay. days. So he was already gone. And then I was there with my, my roommate at the time, Ryan. And then he left the day after or two days after that. And then I was there for another three weeks alone or two weeks alone kind of idea. You did this by yourself. You were, or. He was there with me. Like my buddy was there with me for two days after the crash. And then he had to go home, but I still had, I still had another like two and a half weeks left of trip. <laughs> what are you doing during that time? And it was, <laughs> I wonder what I would do. I'd get up in the morning. I'd spend, I spend about an hour just uh, taking my, cause you'd wake up there. It's you take like my whole body was a, a like my whole body was cut open. Yeah. So wake up and you just like peel the bed sheets out of your, out of your cuts and then you have to you shower but then you you shower there but then you have to use like uh like a clean water because the water there's dirty and then I have to do like 20 minutes of just like cleaning all the cuts out and then another it would take me like three hours to get up and then I would just basically like use the crutches across the street and then just chill at a cafe like I didn't really do much the only thing I after that last two weeks I really did was like I kind of just worked on my computer like worked on pad pal a bit and then would like chill and then i went to go see the uh lions one day they let you in the t- in the cage with like lions and shit so i did that man i'm like yo i'm like an open like wound i was like limping in the lion cage like yeah like you're going into literally the lion's den cut open like i mean i'm not sure if they're like sharks and the second they smell blood they're gonna want to come after you but did you really think that was necessary well it was either that, like it was either that or it was like the like because i was supposed to do the elephant trek but i didn't want to be walking through dirty water in the jungle all day with like <laughs> half my like body cut open so i did the uh did the lion the the lion thing which was now that i think about it it was kind of balls man they just let you right in the cage with lions like thailand is not 
the amount of times I was in Thailand and again, like I didn't have any plans. Like we landed, we landed in Bangkok mm-hmm. and got in a, we got in our like taxi and we said, okay, take us to a hotel. Like I didn't look into anything. I didn't research anything. I didn't like, I didn't know what was going on. So like I went to that, that lion day. It's like, Oh, you can go see the lions. The next thing I know, I'm like, they're walking you in a cage and you can like pet with it and stuff. Like and it, it was, it was wild, man. The other times I'm just like, yo, I can't believe this is planet Earth. Yeah. I, man, I can't even believe I'm having this conversation, to be honest, let alone the actual. <laughs> <laughs> man, yeah. Like, I think, man, yeah, the amount of things there that, like, some things definitely aren't, like, good for the podcast. Like, some things are, some things are going to take with me to the grave, man. But <laughs> there was a couple times there where I was like, yo, like, am I going to get, yeah. <laughs> if someone ever travels to Thailand, like, I, next time I ever do international travel to, like, a country, like that i'm going to be a bit more cautious on kind of what i do and where i I found myself in two other situations where it was like in the back of my mind i'm like yo like are we gonna get robbed or killed right now like what's going on man it was are those two situations that you're taking to the grave or you want to share them (laughs) man no i got man i'll tell you off camera one day man like it's one of those things like i've only told one other person like, like yeah, it, 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 me it's and one time and long story short we were uh me him eight guys eight Thai guys and the they it was like a bar then the, we ended up realizing it was like kind of like a setup thing and then they closed the garage door and we were stuck in there i'll sleep at that it was <laughs> <laughs> and it was like i'm like yo like see there we're getting robbed there we're gonna have to like fight these guys till we die it was yeah we had to switch we had to move to a different town after that i was worried to walk around there in the day it was it was fun (laughs) after all you know what it was fun but you know what sometimes i'm not necessarily recommending that type of adventure but it's definitely more memorable than just you know spending two weeks on an all-inclusive resort well i've never been away man i've never been on a vacay like i've only ever traveled for hockey like i've never been anywhere that was your first time like traveling yeah, man, I'm not even kidding you. Like, I was didn't plan it at all. Like, it was d- mid December is like Christmas grind season. I'm like, yeah, screw it. Like, I want to go away somewhere. I've always been a hockey. Like, I have the money. I have. To, I'm not gonna be working in January, December, January, February. So I just literally like looked at a looked up Google and like nice places to travel that has beaches. And between like the idea crossing my mind to go to Thailand and me buying the ticket was ten minutes. And then the amount of research I did about Thailand was. Uh, someone bought me a book about Thailand and then I read it on the plane on the way there for about 20 minutes and said, screw this. And then figured it out. Like, man, I had no idea what I was doing, man. Oh, like, we got taken advantage of a few times when we got there. Like it was. <laughs> Honestly, that holy smoke. One of the things I noticed in the Instagram photos too, because I guess, you know, looking back on it, because that was February, 2020. North America started shutting down in like March of 2020. You were wearing a like mask and a few of the Instagram photos. Was like COVID apparent there too at that time? Yeah, COVID. Like when I was there, that's when it first was like when I was in Thailand, that's when it was first like coming out in China. Like that okay. right when I was in Thailand was when it was like becoming like a big issue in China. Like when everyone Wuhan, when everything was like crazy. And that's when it was that's when I was in Thailand. Yeah. So just the cherry on top, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing too, I guess. Yeah. So I'm curious now. So after you're in Thailand for like February, then you come back to Canada. And at that point, like we're not at the same scale or even on the same, I guess, like, you know, mass society in the sense of recognizing like what COVID-19 is. Were you like, like, what's your headspace during that time? Man, it was, it was that, yeah, it was really weird. Cause it was like, almost like I was like traveling, like back in time, almost like over there, it was, it was intense, man. Right. Like that was like, when I was in Thailand, I remember I was in, uh, uh, in PP and, um, and like the news was on, it was like, that's when it was going nuts in Wuhan and people there were starting to freak out. And then like all the air, like everything down there for travel was, everyone was like panicking. And then when I landed here, it was normal. Everything was fine. Everyone was like, I remember people were uh, like, like it wasn't really a thing at all. Like it was probably two weeks or three weeks after I was here before everyone started like talking, like caring about COVID. But when I was over there, it was like how it is now. It was like people were getting like freaked out and stuff. 
but then I got here and it was like normal. It was almost like it came over like two weeks behind me kind of idea. And then it was like everyone here started getting the masks. And, and yeah, well, no, because I I've chatted with a few people actually, like one in particular, and you know I don't want to speak on her behalf, but essentially what she was saying was she, like she was over there, like couldn't leave her hotel room whatsoever. She was there for work, so essentially just like went to the work to do the thing then went back to the hotel room could never find like a place to eat or anything like that and was over there for like a week and a half then returned to canada and it was just like it was like the world was normal then a week and a half happened and it was the exact same type of thing that was going on over there that's it's so crazy to think about and even with what you've said in terms of like, Hey, I just want to go on my like first vacation. I have the money for it. Hockey's not a time you go to Thailand, you nearly kill yourself on a motorcycle. Then, you know, COVID is literally, you know, basically starting and, and rapidly spreading over there. Like I, man, this, I'm like, this is the first time I'm like really stumped where I'm like, I don't even know where, where to go anymore with my thoughts and things to ask. Well, yeah, like it was, uh, it was weird for sure, man. It was, it was, yeah, it was kind of like, yeah, it was almost like seeing the future when you're over there and you came back here and then it was just the same, same kind of rollout idea that it was going on over there. Mm -hmm. Like it was, uh, you, you have no idea what to, like over there, it's, it's a gong show, man. Wow. I guess, honestly, hey, this has been, what a ride this has been. <laughs> yeah. Man, honestly yeah I've, yeah I've had quite the uh experiences in my life so far i guess like uh, I'm, I'm not gonna lie when i when i reached out to you and i i started looking into a, a little bit more and you know even from like just kind of being in the same like ottawa circles hearing about you a couple of times i was like i i just i got a feeling this is going to be one of my all-time like favorites and this is going to be a wild ride and you certainly hit my expectations and probably like I, I was expecting it to be a home run and you like this has definitely been the a grand slam holy holy smokes man awesome man i'm happy it's been fun man i wasn't sure what to expect either yeah uh, last time i was on a podcast i had to tell the guy not to air it after because they exposed too much info <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i was just uh i had to ask him just to like put it on hold but this one's been chill it's been good yeah, it's yeah. first official appearance now yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And uh, so I don't know if you've uh, listened to a few beforehand, but essentially this is just the part of the show where you know, I always hand the show over to the guests. So, I mean, it's completely your show now, you know, life, life story, childhood lesson, like basically you can chat about whatever you want. It's uh, all on you there. Yeah. I, I remember I was trying to think about this. Uh, I was thinking I was just going to do a shameless plug. I was just going to say if anyone's in Ottawa that is, um, looking to work this summer or learn about like taking some responsibility on business and stuff like that uh to reach out to me because again like i'm building uh taking i'm taking over ottawa this year pat bell's taking over and uh like i know you have a good network of people and like hopefully hits the right ears like obviously athletes would excel at that position so anyone that's trying to make some bank this summer and want to uh learn learn about business whether it be with pad pal or anything else uh like that's something i enjoy doing a lot is like whenever someone else comes to me with business questions or any interest or anything like that, I get a lot out of like helping out because I guess like I've learned a lot and like I use mentors as well for learning stuff. So um, that's something that I'm always, always open to doing and, and uh, meeting other people that are driven as well. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And I always, uh, I always link like the Instagram or whatever the, whatever social media typically they, I find the athletes use, more frequently but uh so that'll be linked down down below but uh, what are some other ways for people to get in contact with you uh besides socials yeah, yeah well just like what's the best way like how if i'm listening and i i want to take you up on that offer how am i uh how am i getting a hold of you uh it's a either instagram dm or if they send an email to hello at padpal.ca uh my assistant like would for any of that over to me um okay. Yeah, like whether it's like working or, or any questions at all, business or whatever it may be. Yeah, like either Instagram DM or just sending it to like the company website, uh, company email. And then uh, my system will look forward all that info over. Awesome, man. Well, hey, this has been such a pleasure. I, I've had a lot of a lot of fun over the last uh, 90 minutes, man. This has been great. Thankful, I say. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, eh? Thank you. 
All right, that's it for this week, folks. Hope you enjoyed. And if you did, hey, please leave us a review. I love seeing them. You know, it just makes me so happy that you guys are enjoying it because I love doing this. And, you know, we're coming up on one year of Reels Reels. So, hey, hope you've been enjoying it. And in the meantime, stay best kind.